Uh, so we're going to uh, start with our panel now. And we have uh, Mark Johnson from the journal Sentinel. He's also uh, one of our O'Brien Fellows this year. We have Greg Borowski next to him. He's an editor at the journal Sentinel. Uh, he is also a Marquette graduate. We have Jackie Crosby from the Star Tribune, and she is one of our O'Brien Fellows this year. And we have Hal Burton, who is from the Seattle Times, and he was an O'Brien Fellow 2013-2014. And hopefully, we have another guest from Romania. OK, coming. So we also have had some other Pulitzer Prize winners from Marquette. You met earlier Margot Houston and George Laudner, who is still here. Uh, we've had. We've had uh, some Pulitzer Prize winning finalists, uh, Jackie Benazinski and Joan Biskupic, who uh, is, uh, work, she's out of DC. Um, we've had some award winning staff members uh, who won a Pulitzer, James Arity, George Laudner uh, was a, uh, won a, during another time, Terrence McGarry and Neil Milbert. And we've had some award winning editors in addition probably countless editors who have graduated from Marquette, Wallace Carroll, who I think we saw in the, uh, in the video. So we are also happy to uh, co-sponsor this event uh, with the Milwaukee Press Club, and we see our president, Latoya Dennis, in the back. Raise your hand, please. Thank you. And the Journal Sentinel, we have editor George Stanley here. Raise your hand, please. And do we have Jackie now? Say hello. Hello. So Jackie is in Romania. She graduated from Marquette a few years ago and has won a Pulitzer Prize. And she just got to Ro Romania not too long ago. So she still um, is recovering from a 36-hour drive. Uh, not drive, but trip. Yeah. Yeah. OK. That's dumb. So uh, I want to begin by asking uh, Jackie and then Jackie, uh, uh, Hal and Mark, um, to talk about, just give some people a sense quickly uh, what it was that you, uh, what was the work that you received uh, the highest honor for, and what was the big idea that led to it? We'll start with uh, Jackie Benazinski, please. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little foggy and wobbly because it's been a long couple of days. Um, my... Uh, Herb was kind to say that I graduated from Marquette a few years ago because it was more than a few years ago. Um, can you all hear me? Okay, okay. Um, I was covering um, women and minority issues in the early to mid 80s in Minnesota, and I included gay rights issues as part of that since gays were a political minority, social minority at the time. And I just happened to be in that. Um, that slipstream when HIV AIDS rose up. And so um, we at the St. Paul Pioneer Press decided with the guidance of an incredible editor who's now gone, Deborah Howe, that we did not want to get behind this social movement and this um, issue the way the press usually is, but we wanted to get ahead of it. So we plotted out several stories and one of them was a diagnosis to death narrative where we would take readers to walk in the shoes of somebody dying with AIDS. Took the photographer, Jean Pierre and I about a year to find the right subjects. And once we did, we immersed ourselves in their lives for several months and basically did just that, that it was that simple. We, it wasn't a simple thing to do, but the, the concept was that simple that we wanted to take readers along inside the lives of people who at, the early and the most um, fraught times with the AIDS crisis in America, we wanted to take them into those lives and have them know what it was like from the inside out. So it was a concept story. It took a long time to find the right people to support the concept. Um, but it was a very clear direction, and that's what we executed. Um. 
I was part of uh, a five-member uh, team of uh, journalists from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, our story was about a four-year-old uh, boy who was very, very sick and spurred uh, a landmark in medicine. Um, the first that we heard of this was um, a business reporter, Kathleen Gallagher, who got a tip. Um, she did what uh, good reporters do, which is at the end of an interview, she kind of said, so what else is new? And uh, the person she was talking with mentioned several things, including the fact that they had sequenced all of the genes of a child at Children's Hospital. And uh, as soon as she heard that, uh, she ran up and uh, asked me if I knew anything about this. And um, very, very quickly, the paper assembled a team, including uh, photographer Gary Porter, graphics editor Lou Salvador, and uh, videographer Allison uh, Sherwood. And basically what we set out to do uh, at the time that we got onto the story, we knew that they had, um, they had used this technology um, to basically read the genetic blueprint of a child. Um, it was an event that kind of linked um, the landmarks of uh, Watson and Crick discovering the, the, the structure of DNA, and then uh, Walter Gilbert and, uh, and Sanger uh, developing machines that could read that structure. And this was the first time after that and after the, the Human Genome Project that we actually turned all that science into a, a new form of medicine. And our story sort of followed in, the, in three parts. We tried to show how um, both the family involved and the doctors involved handled uh, the ethical difficulties um, and dilemmas uh, that, were, that arose around trying something that hadn't been done before. And, um, at the time that we, we uh, got the tip and started working on the story, we didn't really know how it would end. It was, we were very, very lucky that uh, the family and the doctors and scientists agreed to allow us to follow it because it wasn't at all clear that uh, the child would live or die. And um, f uh, very fortunately, uh, it turned out that the doctors had the uh, use of sequencing uh, was very successful. It, it, uh, they were able to pinpoint the cause of this bizarre illness that, um, that caused this little boy, uh, he, was, he was severely undernourished, and yet whenever he ate food, uh, he got holes in his intestines. And so it was, a, it was just this sublimely cruel disease. And the uh, doctors had tried every other thing they could think of um, they'd done all these individual medical tests, and nothing had been able to pinpoint the cause of his disease. And they were in a situation where, they, where it was so dire that it pushed them that one step ahead to try something that hadn't been, uh, hadn't been done before, and that was um, using the technology of the, from the Human Genome Project to see if they could figure out what inside our... Uh, these, these tiny little parts of a gene, the, the little base parts that are, there are 3.2 billion of them. And this was the first time that, uh, that they used that big idea to try to uh, figure out the cause of a medical uh, problem. So why did your story win the Pulitzer Prize? Was it them or you, your work? Um, well, I have to, I guess I'd have to say that it was both. I mean, you, it's pretty darn hard to win uh, a Pulitzer Prize, I think, by covering a story that's, you know, ordinary. This was an extraordinary case. I mean, it was one of the, the very first in the world. We think it was the second, um, but it was the first time that it was used as medicine. I mean, I think we, we had excellent editors who pushed us to, do the very best with this story. I remember very vividly George saying to us early on, um, he read us uh, uh, part of a story that um, a New York Times reporter had done on uh, part of a DNA series. And he pointed out particularly this really sort of 
small telling detail. And he said, those are the kinds of details you have to find uh, for this story to touch people. And I think that, that had a lot to do with it. Right. And Jackie, you were at another newspaper than one that you're at now, so I'm let them know that. And also, um, another thing that, that for me that distinguishes your uh, honor is that you were relatively um, uh, not as experienced as a reporter as most long investigative reporters. Can you share with them? I might resemble that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was a young uh, sports reporter. I was working for the Macon Telegraph and News, which is in Macon, Georgia, which is um, a small, scrappy paper. It was a Knight Ritter paper at the time. And um, I was approached by management to be part of a story that they wanted to do, um, uh, looking at the graduation rates of athletics or of athletes at the University of Georgia and Georgia Tech, and uh, I was I was fresh out of it was my first job right out of college. I went to the University of Georgia. I had been um, sports editor of the student newspaper, and I had um, written a lot of stories. It was a daily paper there, and had had like many of the students who I've met here so far. Um, I'd had a couple of internships. I was, you know, gung ho to know as much as I could know about journalism. So, um, what what experienced journalists know too is that what we do as a craft is that you know the you get better at it the more you do. Um, but you can even at this early age you can sort of get the skills that you need to sort of be a good reporter. So. So I was paired with um, an experienced um, reporter news side, and um, our series basically just set out to take a look at you know, what was happening to, to athletes at the University of Georgia, and we decided to expand that to Georgia Tech, which was in Atlanta. And um, uh, it was just pretty, a pretty basic premise, and sort of like all stories, you just sort of set out and start digging. And this was in 1985. And um, I actually uncovered, or I was able to um, discover a woman who sort of broke the whole story open for us. And she was a woman who had uh, been head of the English department at what, at college universities, and there's probably programs here in Wisconsin at, at state colleges where they have a program um, to basically lay, uh, level the playing field for um, students who don't come into college ready to take college classes. So at the University of Georgia at the time, it was developmental studies. And the, um, sort of the rule was at the University of Georgia, and it was open to any student, is that you basically have four quarters to pass a basic skills exam. And we're talking reading, writing, arithmetic. But the university system gave uh, all students this opportunity to um, you know, try to get these students who maybe came from poor areas a chance to get up to snuff. You take the basic skills exam at the end of the four quarters or earlier if you look like you're gonna be able to make it. And then you get to exit into the University of Georgia and take college level classes. So um, what happened was that um, this woman had made a stink because there were 10 students who had failed to pass their basic skills exams. And um, nine of them were athletes. Mm. And she flunked them all out. And somebody in the, um, the vice president's office at the University of Georgia said, nope, we're pulling these nine players out and they're gonna play in the Sugar Bowl against Pittsburgh. So, um, so I just, ha I discovered, her name was Jan Kemp, she actually died um, uh, several years ago, but um, she pretty much blew it wide open. I mean, nobody was talking to this woman. I happened to hear about her. I went and talked to her. She was willing to talk to me, 22, 23 years old, I think. And um, she eventually sued the University of Georgia because first she was demoted and then she was fired. And I actually, because I knew I was gonna be talking at this thing, I had to go back and look and see what she was fired for. So she was fired for disruptive conduct 
and failure to conduct adequate scholarly research. So, um, I, you know, timing is everything. Who you know is everything. Um, I've gone beyond my three minutes to say that, um, you know, I think that when I look back on how the process worked for us is that um, I knew a lot of players. I knew a lot of athletes. I knew them in every sport I'd covered them. And um, so I think that that was sort of what I brought to the, um, to the, to the um, partnership that I worked on with Randall Savage. The other thing is that, um, and I think newspapers still do this, is that you don't, your beat reporters need a certain relationship with the sports teams they cover. And that remains sort of the sacred bond. And to this day, I can't believe why they decided to, to pick me out of the, the pool of more experienced reporters. But I think that had something to do with it. Um, and I guess just the other point that I would like to say, so sorry, I sort of, sort of gapped on the, the main thing. So what we did was we uncovered a, pretty much a systematic um, uh, system where athletes were making millions of dollars for the university. They weren't getting an education at the end, particularly those in the revenue producing sports of football and basketball. And in the South, this is obviously, my newspaper had the nerve to take on the sacred cow the University of Georgia where this behavior was um, laid bare. Uh, eventually, uh, Jan Kemp sued one. The university president resigned. Um, uh, we sort of shined a light on, on all of that. Um, and I think the entire NCAA was forced to sort of hold students more accountable or colleges more accountable for not just having their athletes um, and, and the University of Georgia, and it's not all that different today, um, particularly their black athletes were going to school, making millions of dollars, not getting education at the other end, and um, not fulfilling their sort of their, their contract with, with the students to educate them. All right, thank you. So how you have been a member of, you've been a member of journalism that received a Pulitzer at two newspapers, uh, one in Alaska and one in Washington. Uh, can you just kind of tell us um, briefly about both of those and what you, uh, what you learned from those experiences? Yeah, uh, my Pulitzer experiences were separated by about a quarter century of reporting, very hard reporting and all kinds of things from war zones to mudslides to whatever. And, and uh, so it was, so there's a, a lot of time between the two. Um, both of them were things that involved teamwork. And the first story was in Alaska uh, in 1988 uh, uh, when, uh, I, I'm sorry, in, in, in 1987 um, when we were looking at the uh, plight of native peoples across Alaska, and I had gone out to write a story about housing, housing in the bush, which are rural villages all across Alaska where there are no roads. And when I went out to write about housing, really people came and talked to me about housing, and then they would start talking about alcoholism, about suicides, about all the things that were happening in their villages that were just so dysfunctional. And I came back. And I told my editors, you know, I wrote the story about housing, the problems with federally subsidized housing that was falling apart. And I said, really? I went in to talk to my editor, Howard Weaver. I said, really, Howard, what people really wanted to talk to me about was alcohol and what was happening in their villages. And that's what they really wanted to talk with me about. And very briefly, what happened at that same time a, uh, another uh, journalist at the paper had been looking at obituaries in Anchorage and noticing so many young Native men who were dying at such an early age. And we were publishing these obituaries, but he said he had gone separately to my editor and said, there's something going on here. So basically, this relatively small paper, pretty much we kind of stopped our normal reporting of the news for a period of 
months and really focused by sending reporters throughout the bush, also focusing on Anchorage to bring back the story we call it People in Peril. And uh, uh, we were, the, the year of the uh, Exxon Valdez, um, uh, that year as we were deeply engaged in reporting that, we learned that we had won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. And it was truly a, a, t a team effort. Um, and, you know, there wasn't that much time to reflect because there was Exxon Valdez. So you said <laughs> 25 years later, you are now in O'Brien. Right, uh, yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I apologize. I, uh, and what, what happened was I was here. I was pushing very hard my editors to get in to the newspaper what I cared very much about, which was uh, the series that I was reporting on the struggle to reduce carbon dioxide, CO2 uh, emissions in China, and then also the US. But the China piece was just, we were finally, remember her, just about getting that in, when there was a, just a disastrous mudslide in Washington state. And it killed, eventually we found 43 people, March 22nd, 2014. And I was here, and I had done a lot of reporting on unstable slopes and logging in an earlier project for the newspaper. And I knew, and I had worked with uh, one of our data guys, we knew all about like LIDAR mapping, we knew which state reports to look at. We had all this sort of knowledge packed up from that earlier project, and I was able to download while I was here a bunch of those reports about this area and find that there were a whole lot of warnings about this slope being unstable and the impacts, the potential risks of logging it. And I wrote a long memo from uh, Wisconsin here back to the paper that was helped form the basis for one of the early investigative articles that we wrote. But then I was like, God, I just can't be here right now. <laughs> I just can't be here. And I really credit both uh, Herb and uh, Laurie Bergen, who is uh, there uh, as a dean, uh, really just saying, just go. And I went back to the slide zone and was reporting from the, the slide area for the next, I don't know, five, six days. Uh, just to spell other reporters. I didn't, you know, I really just did what everybody else was doing, but people were just so tired because they were rotating through. So that was uh, the Pulitzer Prize for breaking news. And, uh, you know, that was a total team effort. So none of what I was involved in was somehow me taking this project through on my own. It was always a team effort. Well, of course, individuals do do great work and are recognized each year. Mine happen to be teamwork. So Greg, uh, it's often said that events or circumstances win Pulitzers and journalists sort of write the words or take the pictures. You've heard a lot of, from our panelists talking about work that they spent quite a bit of time on. Uh, but you know, as an editor, I'm a, every Pulitzer Prize winner likes to credit an editor. You guys have won three. Um, in the last few years. What does it take um, at, this, at a various size newspaper, what does it take the kind of journalism to be pre Pulitzer Prize uh, worthy? Well, I mean, first I'm gonna recognize Dave Umhafer, who's one of our Pulitzer Prize winners and just finished the O'Brien Fellowship last year. Raquel Rutledge, who's not here, uh, was an O'Brien Fellow. And then two of the other, other fellows, Dan Egan and Meg Kissinger were finalists. So. Um, if, you're, if you know about the Fight Club, you know the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about the Fight Club. <laughs> okay, so we got trip overs, so or maybe I'm not gonna talk too much about how we do it. But um, really though, it's, it's a case where, I mean, you don't set out to win a Pulitzer. I think the surest way to not get a Pulitzer is to say that's my Pulitzer Prize winning story and I'm gonna do it because, I mean, I don't think that anyone who won probably felt at the time necessarily that it was gonna be a Pulitzer uh, winner. Um, I've had the fortune of editing you know, the DNA package for Mark, being one of the editors on Raquel's package and some of the other finalist things. But some of the other work that we've done and that other people even in this room have done is Pulitzer quality work. 
and I, I say that having served two years on a Pulitzer jury where you can see firsthand, I mean, the, the, the quality of work that's out there and the stuff that's just amazing journalism that will get sort of put aside very quickly because it's just not amazing enough that year. So there's a tremendous amount of luck and fortune that goes into it. There's great stories that may win a host of other awards and not win the Pulitzer or, I mean, it's, there's, there's luck, there's politics involved there, but I think, I guess I would, I don't necessarily agree that it's, you know, that these, these stories are just sitting out there waiting to be made into Pulitzers if the right reporter falls into them because it uh, doesn't take into account the work that the reporters do, which is, I mean, when Dave did his uh, pension piece, the, just the, the thorough detail analysis you had to get into to understand this thing. Now, yeah, I'm, I suppose that's a Pulitzer story that's sitting there waiting for someone to stumble on it, but you could have stumbled on it and written a 20-inch story and been done with it, or you could have stumbled on it and said, that's too hard, I'm not gonna try to do it. You know, Mark, when he, and Kathleen, when they came across their story, they recognized right away the potential and how to tell it, and then to go at it with such great diligence and care and craft. I remember, you know, what Mark mentioned, the telling details. I mean, there's a, one of the things that, I mean, there's a image of the kid, uh, Nick Volker, who's, who couldn't, he couldn't eat, right, because he had all these digestive issues, and he's, he's holding, like, a, he's falling asleep holding a bag of, like, pretzel bites or something, Bagel right? Bites. Bagel bites. You know, and there was, and Mark had this great analogy in there, too, about that the DNA uh, mix-up was sort of the equivalent of, like, a, a typo in a dictionary or the Library of Congress or something, and so it's these kind of things that, you know, until that reporter gets so immersed in the story, you know, yeah, that story might have Pulitzer potential, but you don't, you can't really start feeling it or thinking about it later. And then the worst thing to do, as I said, is to just start thinking, well, that's a Pulitzer winner. I, I would never t tell a reporter, I think you're on a Pulitzer Prize winning story because they would never get any more work done. They'd be, you know, <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, uh, I, I was on, it was funny, on the jury, uh, that, uh, Dan Egan was a finalist twice and I happened to be on the explanatory jury of the year the second time. And after we were done, one of the uh, other jurors, Amy Nutt, who works for the Washington Post now, had, she said, oh, so are you gonna tell Dan about that? I'm like, are you kidding me? I, I want him to work for the next <laughs> eight weeks. I mean, it's just the anxiety would be so crazy. I'm not telling anybody about it, you know, so. So there's a, just a few topics I wanna do. I'm gonna ask each one a question, and we'll move to another question. But we will have a chance for any member of the audience that wishes to ask a question, so um, keep that in mind. Jackie, uh, when you, uh, from Romania, so. Uh, Big Jackie. When you uh, think about the realities of today and the changes in the industry, uh, do you think that that is helping or hurting the quest for the kinds of journalism that you'd like to see today? Painful question. Um, the answer is both. We have more tools, we have more, um, access to knowledge um we have we are starting to figure out how to get the public to help us with that because of the tools that we have um so i think um if all things were what they were this would be a better time than ever and i think in many ways it is when i think back to my piece about the two guys who died of aids wouldn't it have been wonderful to have um, audio, video, to hear their voices as they were dying, to let the public hear what I heard when I was sitting with them for hour upon hour upon hour. Um, so I think that's all to the good. Um, I also see news organizations that didn't exist before rising up and finding a way to do this level of work. You know, the standout example, obviously, ProPublica, but National Public Radio and um, alt-weeklies are getting into this level of work. And that means two things. One is that people are doing that kind of work. They're digging in. And I think it's often individuals as much as an institution. I think there are exceptional institutions. I would put the Milwaukee Journal up there. I would put the Seattle Times up there. Certainly, Washington Post, New York Times. But... It really often is the drive of the individual, the passion of the individual reporter, um, photographer, whoever, who just says, I've got to do this. That's all to the good. The downside is I think the contraction in the industry has been um, 
very problematic to the point of dangerous. And I think the bigger danger is, even as we're figuring out how to adjust for that, I think the bigger danger is the speed in which we are, we feel that we have to compete with everything else that is flooded onto the internet causes us to do things without as much care and caution. And I think that's dangerous for the profession. And I think that's dangerous for the public. Thank you. So Jackie from the Soda, by way of uh, Macon. Uh, so you're 22, 23 years old and you have just been named a Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, what does that mean to you at that age or when you think of people who have won since? What does it mean to have won a Pulitzer Prize? How much time you got? Okay, a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you like, know. What I did you do that day? Because it, was it a surprise? Well, I know, it's a long story, Herb. <laughs> So, um, so I went from Macon to the Orlando Sentinel to um, the University of Central Florida to get my uh, master's in business administration that, that I was sort of picking away. And so I was uh, in the middle of final exams my first semester at the University of Central Florida when I got a call from my boyfriend who was uh, working at a paper in um, Columbus, Georgia, who called me and said, you just won a Pulitzer Prize. And I'm like, I got three more exams to take. <laughs> so um, for me, it was um, pretty crazy because I um, was not attached to a newspaper. I, was, I had no support system. Um, I didn't get the bottle of champagne that people get uh, you know, in the middle of their newsrooms. They called me from Macon uh, to tell me, but um, I'm not sure if I should lay this bare, but um, when I wrote the series, so I wrote the Jan Kemp, excuse me, the Jan Kemp story and um, you know, did, all the, did all the work, and when I left Macon, to take the job at the university or at um, Orlando, I said I'm going to finish this series. You know, I've done all this work for it, and I plan to finish this series of stories. And um, for me, it was something of an albatross. I'm trying to move to a new town, start a new um, life, and I've still got this story to write back in Macon. So I actually hadn't read it when it got published. <laughs> So I'm getting calls, so you can imagine, I was kind of a news story. I was uh, the youngest uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, and I wasn't working for a newspaper at the time. So these reporters were calling me, and I was like, they were like, what was your story about? And I was like, oh, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so it was, um, it was pretty intense. I caught, went and talked to one of my professors who wisely told me, because um, of course I was getting job interviews, I was getting um, all sorts of, you know, from all corners, book offers. Um, yeah, it was just pretty crazy. Congressman calling me, and I was pretty young, and it was just me and my dog and my phone ringing off the hook and my stack of books and next to me. So, um, so this, uh, my mentor, Conrad Fink, rest in peace, pretty much said, you know, the Pulitzer is always going to be there. Just get the MBA. Just keep doing what you're doing. And that's sort of been my experience as a reporter. I know it came up in an earlier panel, too, you know, what did it mean to you? And Margo's like, not a thing. <laughs> because, um, you know, for me, I mean, obviously it was uh, sort of a surreal experience, but I did get the MBA. Um, what I did was I sort of got the next very interesting job, which was doing television documentaries, so I did that for a while. That's how I got to Minnesota. I worked for a TV station. I really miss working in newspapers. I um, interviewed for a job back when they were trying to get this internet thing going off the ground and they were like, hey, you're the perfect person. You know TV and you know the newspaper culture. So I did, I helped build the first um, uh, online news service at the Star Tribune, but I really missed reporting. So it took me actually, it was actually a struggle to get back to reporting, but 
my experience, and I think it's been the re experience of other Pulitzer Prize winners I know, is that you've got a deadline. Like, you just, you like got a story to write. You've got a paper to fill. Um, yeah, it's always going to be there for me. It's like the first line of my obituary, but um, I was really young, and it may or may not have uh, made a difference for other people, but I mean, basically, you know, what are you going to do for me today? Right, Greg? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, what story? are you going to do for me today, Mark? <laughs> so, Mark, you, uh, uh, what's it like when you've spent a long time working on a series that matters and gets the acclaim, and then they ask you to go cover cops or uh, go, you know, work a Sunday or something like that? Do you uh, tell them, listen, my name's Mark Johnson, I'm a Pulitzer Prize winner? Or? It's a good way to get uh, yourself on an editor's uh, hate list. Like, they put your picture up and throw darts. Um, actually, the thing I try and keep in mind is that um, I started at some really small papers. Uh, my first paper was a, a weekly, 8,000 circulation, and um, we had no such thing as overtime. We just we were regularly working Saturdays and Sundays, and you just did everything. There were like three reporters, and you know when we finished writing the stories. Uh, you know, we'd go and help lay them out, and from time to time, the editor would shout at us, like, you know, there's a hole on page seven, and we'd have to actually, like, write something. He'd, he'd say, like, uh, you know, didn't something else happen at the meeting? And, like, well, I wrote, like, five stories from that meeting, and, you know, and I think a lot of the other papers I've, I've this was, Milwaukee's my fifth paper, and um, so I've written no bits, um, I've covered cops, I've covered business, um, and so I think it's, it's, it's not that hard to, to go and do that stuff, and in some ways you want to, uh, because you don't want to be the person that immediately, you know, I'm a plus or you know, you know, you don't want to ask for like an office and a crate of grapefruits every month or something. Um. I'm going to just ask how a question, if you have a question, do you like, uh, let, us, let our student assistants know. Um, how, uh, what's the most misunderstood or the biggest misconception you find about uh, winning a Pulitzer Prize as people perceive you after? Well, um, I would, I really think that it's, it's partly the serendipity of it all. There's so so much good work that's done, and as Greg has mentioned, the politics or the, just the judging of the day, or, or maybe there's so many different things that go into it that, to, and this has taken me a while, but I've, I've been in journalism a while, not to measure your self-worth by a Pulitzer. I, I know good work in my gut when I see it, or when I do it, because I think I have pretty hard on myself. And when I see good work, I respect it. Whether it's won a Pulitzer or not, conversely, there are a few Pulitzers that, yeah, they were great writing, but were somewhat derivative of work that others I knew very well had already done, and they caught the thunder, and they put it in a great packaging, and they expanded in it, maybe in a major media, but, but other reporting had preceded it. So that's, that's one of my takeaways, and I would urge people, as much as there's all this fantastic work that's been done by the Pulitzers, and as much as we rightfully respect them, not to define your journalism career necessarily by that. Look at good work and appreciate it in of itself. Thank you. Uh, question, please. Identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm Jenny Fisher. I'm a sophomore journalism student here. Um, talking about a Pulitzer in your career, do you believe that a Pulitzer highlights the peak of your career, or do you think it kind of goes up from there? Jackie, for, for anyone. <laughs> Jackie, for, did you hear it, Jackie? Yeah, I did. 
um, God forbid it should define the peak of your career. I would have been dead at 35. Jeez. Um, I think that's kind of depressing to think about. No, it doesn't define the peak of your career. It opens doors. There's no question. It opens doors. You can pick up the phone and talk to people. It it creates opportunities. Um, none of us would be in this room today without that. But no, the peak of your career is always tomorrow. It's not today. And the day that you figure out that it was yesterday as opposed to tomorrow, then I think maybe you need to be done or find a new career. Um, there, I'm not. I'm not dismissing its impact on a life, but no, it's one story. It's one story. You've done it well, and then the key is what did you learn so you can go to the next story, the next story, and the next story. My students at Missouri always ask me, "What does it take to win a Pulitzer?" And I say, "You do it one paragraph and one story at a time, and you keep your eye on the prize. And the prize is not the Pulitzer. The prize is the story in front of you because that's what you need to honor: is the story in front of you and the people you're doing it about and for. Um, you know." Life is short, but careers are long. So no, I don't think it's the peak of a career. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Another question, Another please. Question. Identify yourself. Identify yourself. Oh, oh, there it is. Hi, my name is Jennifer Walter. I'm a journalism student. Um, and I'm wondering, so Pulitzer Prizes um, highlight some of like the high, like highest tier journalism, great reporting, everything. How do you compete with, um, just like social media and everything and just all this garbage that's put out on the internet and how people will share things that are like clickbait, but they won't necessarily share long-term investigative stories that are done over years and highlight really important issues. How do you compete with that? Great. Um, I think that's kind of a misconception. I mean, sure, there's a lot of stuff that goes around on Twitter like that, but we found when people uh, get a quality, in-depth story that's well presented and well conceived and well written. People will stick with it online. They'll share it. They'll. It'll. I mean, some of the when you get the metrics of how long people read some of these stories, when you get you know, 15, 17 minutes or longer, people are going to find good journalism, no matter what you know the platform it is on. And then just to expand a little bit on a couple of things that were said before. I mean, I I really. What Jackie just said about you know focus on the story in front of you, I mean so many of the things that ultimately become a Pulitzer Prize winning thing, or any other, which is a, a quality piece, is just a tip that you get because you've worked your sources, because you've been doing your daily job. It doesn't just like fall from on high and say now here's that Pulitzer winner for you. I would guess if someone went through and did a, a study of all the Pulitzer things that won Pulitzer prizes and tried to figure out well, which were editor ideas and which were reporter-driven ideas that the reporter got from their work, the vast majority would be reporter-driven. And then another thought just occurred to me, it's a story to share because this is where a case where I was a reporter in Lansing, Michigan, when the Detroit News won a Pulitzer for uncovering the House Fiscal Agency scandal where there were um, the guy, the director, John Moorberg, was basically laundering money and buying it for this crazy stuff. And I was covering the legislature, so it pissed us off to no end that Jim Mitzelfeld and I forget Eric Friedman had, had gotten that story. And we thought, well, they must have these sources. They must have went to the Detroit News because they're so big. And what happened, we found out later, was that you know, Jim Mitzelfeld was covering a, a, a hearing or one of the Senate sessions, and there's a bathroom in the back of the chamber that reporters actually aren't supposed to go into. But he was in there using you know, sitting down to you know, do some things. And, and he overheard people who walked in and were talking about this. So it's like, so then they're just like, like, we're not even supposed to be in there, damn it. What the hell is he doing in there? Why is he getting that story? But I mean, that's, sometimes that's what, what happens too. So there is that stroke of luck sometimes, but you can't. But then they followed it up to the point it was just an amazing set of reporting because the first thing they did, we found out the next morning when we went to the House Fiscal Agents and asked to look at some of the records was they had photocopies of all the records. And because this created an investigation, all the records were then carted away so no other reporter had access to these records. And they would just spin these stories out day after day after day. And our editors would just look at us like, can't you get these stories? And it's like, yeah, I can get those stories if I worked for the DA's office, but <laughs> that's where the records are. These guys have like, Files them. So it's just, you know, you, if you could get that connection between the, you know, the story that arrives and that possibility and you put the hard work into it and, and pursue it correctly, that's where the, the, this, this quality journalism really comes from. Next question. 
Hi, my name is Jabril Faraj. I'm a reporter with the Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service. We're actually housed here in Marquette. Um, my question, and I'd maybe like to hear from a couple of you briefly, um, if you have an, an answer or would like to uh, answer. My question is, what did you do or learn before the story that I won a Pulitzer that um, allowed you to do that story in the way that you did? Um, one of the things that uh, that I think of is uh, I had, uh, I had learned uh, maybe a few years before then to just how much it helped me to read stories out loud, and one of the things that I always remember about the DNA series was that in the final week to ten days before the series ran, um, Kathleen Gallagher and I every day read every part of the series back and forth to each other and used that time to check any uh, facts that sort of jumped out at us, correct any awkward uh, sentences or it, it, uh, it gave me that, uh, that feeling that, um, that there still should be a quality of sort of the spoken word in, uh, you know, in uh, a piece of reporting. And, and that you've got to do, you hang on to it until it's absolutely ripped away from you. And you, you read it on the flats until, I mean, even if it drives copy editors crazy, you, you, you've got to leave it all on the, the court, so to speak. Or unless a conference is coming. So you heard it there from a Pulitzer Prize winner Drive the copy editors crazy. <laughs> That's okay. Very Sorry, that wasn't. <laughs> I thought that was just me. Yeah, no. me too. Uh, another question? Yes. Identify yourself, please. Hi, my name is Amelia Jones. I'm a junior, and I'm a journalism major. Um, my question is: As students, we learn that journalism is obviously a process, and it can sometimes be a really long one, depending on the story, and sometimes it goes really fast and you and your editor can knock it out. Um, besides the finished product, what is some of your favorite parts about the process of journalism? Hmm. I would say for me, it's just getting out of the office, doing the interviews, being in a place, learning about a place. Obviously, there's a lot of data crunching and stuff that's involved in different stories, but I find like a lot of freedom and just the act of reporting and going out and exploring in the world. And that's what really has kept me in journalism. Often the writing is, you know it's inevitable and it's a hard thing, but you do it, but yeah, getting out. I'm sort of suspicious of people like Mark who say they like to write. <laughs> I don't know. That to me is the hardest part. I, um, it's, for me, I agree. It's, um, it's getting out on the ground level. Um, it's, I mean, that's sort of where, the, where you hear what's, what's really going on. And um, you know, usually you can come back and you can find somebody, some expert or some person there. But a lot of times where I find my best stories are just from, from talking to people. And sometimes it is. Sometimes you're there, well, oftentimes you're there to talk about one thing and you hear something else. So I think, um, you know, really, I've always felt like this. Every story I've ever gotten um, is, uh, you know, it's just being unwilling to, to give up. But the the thing, that I, the thing that I do um, worry about, and I've heard this among some of the, the professors here, is that um, you have to, I think, you have to just sort of realize that you don't know everything. I mean, we're showing up and we're just like mere citizens, and we're really curious. And I think that with the advent of you know, public media, and you can just sort of communicate through your text or your, you know, your email or whatever, that, it, that people don't really want to talk face to face. And um, I know this isn't quite your, your question, except that, that what I know is that you do need to not just talk to people on the phone, but you need to show up at their house. And you need to um, sort of not just be fearless of 
you know, when you have to talk to important people that are maybe going to be aggressive with you. It's like you have to just sort of be fearless about looking like, you know, you don't know everything and bumbling through it and just knowing that you don't have all the answers and you have to talk to people to get to that. You just, you know, that's where the surprises come from. And I think that's what I like the most is the surprises. Well, I mean, you know, what, what, Jackie, it just occurred to me one thought on the, I mean, in the digital world today when there's so much information available online, sometimes people just go, well, I, I read all those reports. I don't have to go to the meeting and talk to people, or I just got it. And I think that's an impediment that can be a challenge to the really quality journalism if you say, well, I read the study, and I did this, and I emailed a few people. If you haven't gotten out to meet the person on their own turf or whatever, I mean, that, that you're just never going to get there at that quote, even on a daily story. You, know, you can't just say, I'm in, at my desk. I mean, when I was at my first paper, we had a day when the the, the uh, Marion, Indiana small paper, the, the phones went out, okay? And it was like this liberating thing because you could go walk over to City Hall and actually talk to people. You know, as in you get out of, away from your desk and someone was like, well, what do we do now? And it's like, you get out of the friggin' office and you go talk to people. What do you think you do now? But I mean, that, that's, you still have to force yourself to do that sometimes when you can just now, type a nowadays few Nowadays with a lot of uh, public affairs people, particularly in government, not only can you not sort of talk to them on the phone and hear a voice, you know, so many people deal, only feel comfortable in written statements, much less knock on their door and come mm -hmm. chat. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more that way, I notice. Mm -hmm. Well, put it down into me in writing, and I'll send you back a written statement. More mm -hmm. and more. Since uh, Jackie went all Trump <laughs> on me, uh, I, wanna, I, do, I do love the writing process, but that's not my favorite part. Oh. I, I, I love interviews and I love the kind of interviews where you sit for two or two and a half hours and people tell you stuff you had no idea about it. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago for uh, my O'Brien project I was talking to a scientist and it was like every five minutes he was bringing up some little fact that was just bizarre and fascinating and I, I, I know this sort of feeling really specifically because when I left the interview, uh, I probably shouldn't be telling this, but when I left the interview, uh, I get in my car and I've got this, that sort of buoyed feeling you get when you've had, you know, there's lots of good material and you're all excited. And I'm not really, you know, driving my, my best. I was just still in, I was in the parking lot that the professor uses and I backed up went a little bit like on the, sort of on the curve. And I heard a big thunk. And when I drove back out, my muffler and tailpipe were <laughs> on the parking lot, just lying there in this rusted out heap. And I was really embarrassed because it's where the professor parks his car. And he, he didn't actually see this, thank God, but that he would, I figured I couldn't just leave the Anyway, that's what happens to me when I have a really great interview. I just like, everything else just like, wow. Well, that expense report makes a little more sense. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we're at the uh, last hour. So Jackie, if you uh, thank you again for joining us for many. Any final words to close this out, please? Um, yeah. Um, if, you, if you want, there are all kinds of ways to do journalism. There are all kinds of ways to bear witness. And I've learned not to judge the ways people want to do it. But if you want to be a writer, a journalistic writer, you've got to be a reporter. All good writing in journalism is good reporting, and all great writing is great reporting. The writing will come, um, but if you don't want to report, if you don't want to, if you're not curious about the world, if you don't want to get out in the world and find out about it you're not going to ever do the story that really, really makes a difference. I tell my students if they want to write for themselves, I'll give them a journal and wish them a happy life. But you've got to pay attention to the people you're doing this about and for, which means it's always about the other person. And if you don't find joy in that, it's hard, it's exhausting, but if you don't find joy in that, then you've got to think about whether or not this is the right thing for you. The other thing I would say is I have a mantra that says don't quit until you get good. And you don't get good at this until you've done it for a while. 
And so if there are students in the room and you're 25 and 26 and don't think you've reached the place you want to be, talk to me when you're 35 and 36 because you can't quit until you get good. And as in any craft and art, it takes words on the page and paragraph after paragraph and story after story and you just have to keep doing it and believing it. And every story you do, even if they're like those little chippy ones, they're rehearsal for the next story you're going to do and then it happens. you got to believe in it. So thank you to our panels. Give them a round of applause, please. I remember when uh, Dean Bergen approached me and suggested that this was opportunity was coming, and I was a little ambivalent um, because I uh, I thought I knew what the program could be, but I wasn't sure about it, and so I go down to have a sit down conversation with George Stanley and he talked about what the opportunity was for the program and, and uh, he said to me his goal was that an O'Brien fellow would win a Pulitzer Prize and that Marquette would be able to take credit for it because sharing the credit because of the work that our students and faculty were contributing that I was like that I could that 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 uh, that turned the knob for me. That I thought that that would be worthwhile for one of our projects to win a Pulitzer Prize, and our students um, being able to contribute to that. And so when I saw um, something in the Journal Sentinel this week, in which a Pulitzer Prize winner was the first byline, and someone who just graduated with her second degree with Marquette University, with the second byline on that, I said, "We're on our way." So. <laughs> but you weren't in it for it anyway, right, Greg? Well, Zach, thank you, everybody. <laughs>